I had the uh, honor of addressing the Board of Healthcare Funders at the Cape Town International Conference Centre last week. <clears throat> and when they briefed me, they told me, well, tell us how things are going in the economy and so on, and maybe a slide or two on SADC. Um, <clears throat> and then when I went for the registration, I was, there were the seven, 700 delegates, of which about a third came from the rest of Africa. I saw on the program it said that I, I should tell him how to fix Africa's problems. <laughs> So at least I had an hour to prepare, <clears throat> and maybe Loki will appreciate this, um, but um, in that hour I, I thought long and hard about, I think it was Crosby, Stills and Nash, or probably Neil Young, who once said, the only good general is a dead general. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but anyway, so I told them that the African Union should have one objective, only one objective, stop the wars. Four million people have lost their lives in a neighboring country in a civil war in the last 15 years. We're talking DR Congo here. Now, just to put that in perspective, that's the combined population of Namibia and Botswana. And 20% of those people are young boys who are younger than 16 years old. They should be at school. They should be learning how to read and write and develop non-military skills. And once I've succeeded in stopping this, this, this war in, uh, on this continent, everybody is carrying on about Ukraine and Russia, and I know it's terrible and it's tragic, but what about our own continent? They're talking about 50 people a day uh, perishing in that war in Ukraine. In the African context, it's closer to 5,000 a day. Uh, and then once I've done that, and this is possible because the European Union, in the late 1980s, and some of you, Bernard, good to see you again, Bernard uh, is experienced enough, that's a much more diplomatic word than old, uh, to remember the, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, but many of you will remember that, 1989. It's the same year in which um, the National Party engineered the demise of Pevi Buita, and I know all about that. We should actually write a book about that. Midnight cabinet meeting with Choppers, and they told him that he's going to resign tomorrow morning. And a couple of months later, Mandela was... Uh, released from prison, and uh, the rest is history. We've, we've got a, a fully-fledged democratic constitution in South Africa. But <clears throat> at the time, there were literally hundreds of thousands of Russian soldiers, and I think we've all seen visit, vividly in the last couple of weeks what Russian soldiers are capable of. They're capable of murdering primary school children. Anyway, they were stationed in the erstwhile Eastern European States, which were communist states, which since most of them have become democracies and free enterprise economies. And the European Union realized that if these hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers were to go back in mass to Russia, it could create a lot of instability. So what they did is they, they transformed all those military camps into more like educational institutions, not quite as grand as, as Gibbs. I've seen one of my ex-Gibbs students here as well. Um, nice to see you. Um, and then they identified, this was a huge project, the biggest project I ever had. They, they identified non-military skills amongst those people, from plumbers to electricians to lawyers, hopefully not too many, uh, accountants. <laughs> uh, I started my career as an accountant, by the way, but I did see the light. Um, and then slowly but surely they released him back into Russia, and initially it, it did have a hugely beneficial impact on stability in general. And of course, then what the African Union should do then, apart from identifying non-military skills amongst these, these warring factions all over our continent, uh, is then send them to school or send them and send them to the field so that they can start producing food. The world needs food. The need, world needs education. Uh, I don't have to tell you that. So uh, I'd like to believe there is a future. Um, you've seen uh, the, the bad news about those the drones, is that correct, Loki? Um, and that, uh, but quite frankly, most of what Loki spoke about was stuff that you must know, and many of you know that already. Now we're moving over to the probably nice-to-know environment, and, and there's a lot of stuff that, uh, that is actually nice to know uh, in my slides, believe it or not. I think there are only two things more difficult to do than to speak about economics immediately after lunch, although happy hours is even worse. Uh, and those two things are trying to climb a cliff that is leaning towards you, or trying to kiss a lady that is leaning away from you. <laughs> I'm going to give it my best shot anyway. Now, <clears throat> this is 
arguably one of my favorite slides. If Loki had told me Rolf, something went haywire with our timing, you've got 10 minutes, five slides. This would probably be, have been one of them. Because it is a, a remarkable slide. Um, this, that social protection slice, 370 billion rand. We're talking about more than a, a third of a trillion rand. This is not Mickey Mouse money we're talking about. That is what we spend on the grants. And what's in that red slice, of course, is the extension of the COVID relief grant. So currently this country, I'm going to get back to this, currently this country is paying grants every month to almost half of our population. Almost half. And when Dilis Shislobo agrees with me, the AGBIS senior economist, I'm a bit of a mentor to him, we work together from time to time, he agrees with me that this has had a hugely beneficial impact on agriculture because the bulk of those grants are spent on food. Um, and that's the 350 a month, right up to the 2000 a month for the old age pension and the disability grant. That is incredible. There is no other country in the world that pays grants to such a large proportion of its population than South Africa. No developing country in the world spends more money as a percentage of GDP on grants outside of Brazil than South Africa. Lula da Silva, who implemented the Bolsa Familia in, in, in uh, Brazil, they have a, 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 m a superior mechanism within their political setup to punish people that, that get uh, caught with their fingers in the till or that get favors. He got a subsidized holiday home somewhere on the coast, uh, and then somebody at Petrobras got a tender. It was Mickey Mouse stuff compared to what the Zuptas did to this country. Mickey Mouse. It was, a, it was a fraction of the money that was stolen by Mr. Jacob Zuma and his friends, many of whom will be in jail next year. We must just get beyond the December NC elective conference because many of the people that will be there <laughs> will be in jail next year, or several of them anyway. Lula da Silva was caught out. He went to jail, by the way. He went to jail. No fuss. Went to jail, served a couple of months in jail. Uh, and by the way, he's going to probably beat Bolsonaro in a couple of months' time from now. Um, the way that he reorganized their social protection scheme is unbelievable. What Brazil did with the Bolsa Familia, it's also a grant, but it's a conditional grant. There's some investment in human capital via schooling, via uh, healthcare facilities. Uh, so you get the grant, but it's conditional on, on achieving certain milestones. And, and that's what me and my team are currently actually recommending to National Treasury. We've been asked to also uh, do a cost-benefit and a macroeconomic impact analysis of making the COVID grant permanent, probably at a slightly higher level. That, what, what Brazil did, what Lula da Silva did, is regarded as one of the 10 most outstanding policy successes in the developing world in the last 50 years. Uh, and, and we can probably emulate them at some point in time. But what is fascinating about the slide as well, um, and also this one. Actually, I'm going to jump to this one. Can you see the, what happened to our gross public debt GDP ratio in the last budget? It started going down. It stabilized. Gorongwana, Inok Gorongwana, the new finance minister, is probably the best finance minister we've had in a very long time. After probably, was Trevor Manuel ever finance minister? He was a good finance minister, except he didn't... Um, he didn't hear the warnings about uh, the, the growth in the economy in 2004, 2008. So he was a little bit stingy. He took us to a budget surplus instead of um, expanding a, a, a renewable power supply. He was a bit sinner, om het so te stel. He liked to keep the fiscal purse uh, shut. But what Godungwana did is actually amazing because this doesn't happen every day. Every year in a democracy, when the Minister of Finance in a particular country has to present a budget, there are, also, there are always two main lobby groups that want to influence the Minister's decision on how to taper with expenditure and taxes. The one group wants more welfare expenditure, which in principle is not bad as long as you can afford it, but sometimes they also want to fund this with higher personal income tax or higher company tax, and that's where the free marketeers come in, that's the other lobbying stream, they say, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. If you incentivize productivity, if you incentivize private sector formation, business formation, employment creation, then you will broaden the tax base. Then you don't have to raise tax rates. The taxes will be more. 
and then you can spend more money on welfare. And God and Guana satisfied both of these streams in this last budget because he ex extended the COVID grant for a full year. So even the black sash said, yes, this is good. And he, and he lowered the corporate tax rate. I think Loki knows all about that. It's not such a big deal, but it helps a little bit. It does help a little bit. It may even uh, help to pay 10% of that new facility. I'm not 100% sure about the figures. But certainly we need to look at that. So it was really a magnificent budget. Um, and it doesn't remind me actually of, of this joke about Vasco da Gama being the first public sector economist in this part of the world. The reason for that is that he found himself at a place where he didn't know where he was. And he didn't know where he was going to. But government was paying for it. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like home affairs, doesn't it? And just by the way, South Africa's public debt GDP ratio at 70% uh, is about half of America's. Of course, our bond yield is higher, so you have to bring that into the equation. And um, Japan's, if you look at this slide, is probably down there uh, near the highway, <laughs> 300%. Uh, so ours is, is quite stable. And before I forget, you've probably, you've probably seen the good news, Standard & Poor's has upgraded South Africa's sovereign debt over the weekend from stable to positive, but we still have one or two uh, you know, steps to go before we are uh, investment grade. But if you look at international fund managers buying South Africa's bonds and equities, then it's clear that they don't, you know, uh, they don't take the, the ratings agency that seriously, but it's still it's really good for us. Now, the slides that I have uh, in a short while are so, uh, I wouldn't say unbelievably optimistic, but they are, they are very optimistic and, and they contain data which you will not read in the newspapers every day unless you get engineering news. Who gets engineering news from time to time? I'm sure Loki uh, has a look at that. Uh, and if you look at engineering news, then you'll also notice they will, for instance, also report on impact results. Uh, I think, see, Astral is, is represented here. Astral had a very good year. Um, a firm like Raubex increased their profit up to just short of 1 billion rand, 150%, 150% increase in their profits. And one of the reasons for that was progress with government's infrastructure program. I know there's a huge gap and we've got a long road to travel, but it's not as if nothing is happening in the sphere of infrastructure. Uh, National Treasury has just waived uh, some of the tender procedures, which is brilliant news for Sandral and Eskom to try to... Um, build some roads, especially in the northern provinces. Uh, if you want to make somebody in the ANC really mad, then you must ask them, how do you like the roads in the Western Cape? I love already Donner and in elk geval. Uh, it can be done, by the way. It can be done. It's not rocket science to fix a pothole, but apparently in some municipalities they uh, haven't quite got that, uh, uh, that skill captured yet. Salgar themselves, this SA Local Government Association, did a survey recently, a comprehensive survey, and they found that 65% of the municipal employees in this country are computer illiterate. They can switch the computer on, they don't know how to switch it off. Uh, this is frightening stuff. Uh, we've got a long road to travel before we can correct that third bullet point, the public sector incompetence that characterized this country for a decade. Well, I don't have to tell you that this country deserved better than we had under Zuma. I don't, really don't think I need to tell you that. And if you have an inkling of sympathy for that person and the crooks that he appointed to lead this government in all spheres, municipal, provincial and national, just remember one thing. For seven years, Zuma deliberately stalled the new re renewable energy program. If it had not been for that, there would not be load shedding in South Africa today. So please don't have sympathy with those bunch of crooks. What they did to this country was almost disastrous. And Ramaphosa has to turn this around. Now, how do you turn around 10 years of absolute pathetic governance through nepotism and incompetism, fraud, corruption and theft? If you think I'm being tough on these people, read the Zonu Commission report. Okay, please read that. And read the charge sheets that are going to come out if, as these people slowly but surely get arrested and prosecuted. 
this was really bad. Now I'm going to pause, I must fix this. I like the analogy of, of a container ship at sea, something which is close to your heart. Now this container, it's a huge ship, one of the biggest you can find. It's going in the wrong direction, it, 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 almost like the Titanic. And now you have to turn this thing around. That doesn't happen like when I drive. <laughs> it's not like you get a trabi brick and a hand brick and then you go. No, then you go like It can take weeks before that thing turns around in the right direction. This is a long, arduous journey. And people often tell me, but why does he still have people like Matasha in, in the cabinet? And, and Lindy was his Sulu. I did suggest to uh, somebody in his office, whom I know quite well, that they... Um, I, I believe that the ambassadorship to Somalia is vacant, and they, they're probably considering that, I hope so, anyway. Um, Jan Smits was asked, and this is, it's, this is recorded in the Hansard. Jan Smits was asked in Parliament, I believe more than a century ago, what is a member of Parliament's foremost task? And his answer was, you must get re-elected. Ramaphosa must get re-elected in December by the ANC. I've got no doubt he's going to make it. The fact that the National Executive Council of the ANC, which is arguably more powerful than the cabinet in South Africa right now, uh, because the cabinet is pretty useless, um, they have now just taken the decision that if you step aside, and we're now thinking Aisna Gashule and this lady in, in, uh, in Natal, Durban, uh, who also stepped aside because of allegations of corruption and fraud, but she was now elected uh, the head of the ANC in, in KZN. Uh, and now the ANC has taken the decision that if you have to step aside because of allegations of serious crimes, then you are not allowed to stand for any ANC position anymore. And the fact that he could swing that in the NEC, there's more to this than meets the eye. His support in the NEC has gone from about 53% in December 2017 to close to 80% today. And what I've just told you is unbelievably good news. Uh, because he knows exactly how to fix this country. I could not believe my ears when in his sauna this year in February, he said, the only way, the only way that this country can get back to sustained 5% growth, which we had, by the way, for four years in succession, that's when I won the competition, which you forgot to mention. But uh, <laughs> the Economist of the Year Award, and you don't win that because of your stage performance or your jokes, you win that because of the accuracy of your forecasts. And we can get there. But what did Ramaphosa say? He said the only way we can get there is if we allow the private sector as much leeway as possible. I do not have to tell you that the difference, especially in the northern provinces, between going to a public sector organization, be it Muddy Bank Municipality, which is the worst in the country, be it Home Affairs, and going to a private sector institution, any one of them, uh, is, is like night and day, that difference. We have international best practice with this firm, with virtually, if not all the companies represented here today. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And there's such a huge gap between the service standards and the quality of service in the pub private sector and in the public sector. You know why they changed the streets in Pretoria into one-way streets many years ago? It was to prevent the civil servants that arrive late from obstructing those that are going home early. It actually had a beneficial productivity effect, but in any event... Okay, so as far as this bad news is concerned, I'm not here to tell you bad news, because you can read all about this in the Cape Crimes or the Disaster. Uh, Iqbal surveys a bunch of pathetic newspapers, and he still has something to answer to as well for that AO technology uh, scam. And that was a scam. That's worse than a pyramid scheme. And I'm convinced that Shamila Batoya has a little dossier on her table with Iqbal's name. Uh, I hope so, in any uh, event. Um, I'm aware of these problems, we all are. Uh, what we should ask ourselves is, okay, in the first place, is this unique to South Africa? Are there other countries that are also battling with some of these problems? Of course. But what exacerbated, the second question is, what exacerbated these ills and problems we have? And, and Loki, you will probably remember, that I showed you this slide last year as well, and I, I just have to repeat it. This, is, this slide is full of bad news, but I want, to sp I want you to spot the good news. If you take Petro SA's loss in one year, 14.5 billion rand, in one year, 
That is 10% of South Africa's total annual agricultural production. 10% of that, one state-owned state -owned enterprises loses in one year. A commission was appointed to investigate how the hell did this happen, and they came out and said, well, the people at Petro SA don't actually know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. We call that incompetence. There are stronger words, but there are ladies here, so uh, I'll leave that. Dudu Mieni wants to make a contribution. She is, after all, running the Zuma Trust or something like that. Uh, 5.7 billion she siphoned off SAA in one year. And then municipal, irregular municipal expenditure. Funny enough, all of that 14.8 billion comes from ANC municipalities. So if you add those three together, that's the good news. There's only three items. There are many more, like Gamas, locomotives. So he buys motor locomotives. I think 40 billion, Loki, uh, can you remember the figure? I think it was about 40 billion rands worth of locomotives. They don't fit on the railway lines. I mean, did he really think he was going to get away with it? Mr. Zondo, in so many words, said, take him first, and then Molefe, and then Coco. Uh, and they're in serious trouble. Uh, in any event, you add those three together, what do you get? If we had a competent government, if we had a government that was in it for South Africa, not for their own pockets, then we could have built, just with those three items, 650,000 RDP houses. And we could have created 210,000 jobs. Those are only three items. The question we must ask ourselves is, the ills that we have, the problems, the challenges, can we fix them? Of course we can fix them. This country is ranked, it's classified by the United Nations as an upper middle income country. Not middle income, not lower middle income, not poor, not abject poverty, upper middle income. Our per capita income is close to 90,000 rand. Our total national income divided by the total population, all 60 million of us. We can fix all of these problems, not overnight, but we can f fix all of them if we have the right policies. Policies can make or break a country. I don't have to tell you that Zimbabwe did not become a failed state because of a lack of resources. Am I right? Who's been to Zimbabwe? Uh, especially the farming community. Th they will realize that Zimbabwe was one of the ten largest food exporters. They've got all our natural resources. They've got tourism potential that we don't have. We don't have the Vic Falls bordering our country. It is really, it, wa it was and still is potentially a magnificent country. But policies, the wrong policies, destroyed that economy. And according to the Institute of Security Studies, there are between three and five million Zimbabweans in South Africa. I don't blame them, by the way. <laughs> um, economic policies can, can make or break a country. Venezuela is one of the latest examples of exactly that. Once again, this country has oodles of resources, fantastic agricultural potential, and oil. One of the ten largest oil reserves in the world. But nobody is going to invest there because the government takes it. Nationalization is another word for stealing, except that the thief is usually an incompetent bureaucrat or politician. And Mr. Chavez and Mr. Mugabe have posthumously combined been nominated for the Nobel Prize for, for chemistry. <laughs> they, they've done something incredible. They changed those current countries' currencies into another substance. Yeah, you see a direct result. I'm almost through with the bad news, by the way. Yeah, you see a direct result of state capture. This is a direct, quantifiable result of state capture. Because of incompetence, gross incompetence, the state-owned enterprises don't know how to build dams or roads or link the renewables to the grid. They're starting to find out now. And the writer is trying to open the door for maximum private sector participation with Ramaphosa's assistance and encouragement, not Mr. Mantasha's. But Mr. Ramaphosa needs Mr. Mantasha until December. <laughs> then he doesn't need him anymore. So perhaps he can send him to uh, Ethiopia uh, as an ambassador. He would do well there. The private sector has taken heed not only of the recovery from COVID. By the way, I'm self-employed, as you've probably noticed. And everybody's entitled to their own opinion, 
but not to their own facts. And every single opinion that I have is based on fact. The private sector capital formation is not exactly where it was prior to COVID, but it's getting there at the rate of knots. Inter alia, thanks to companies like Impact. I don't have to tell you that. Our inflation is much lower than, <laughs> substantially lower than uh, the US, Spain, Mexico, the UK. I mean, this is incredible. This hasn't happened in many, many decades, by the way. Um, there are reasons for that. And one of those reasons is, number one, we are a huge net exporter of food. Uh, we have, and number two, we have the most diversified economy of any emerging market in the world. So we can actually supply a lot of stuff that has been scarce because of the international supply side constraints. We've got factories that can manufacture the stuff. Not only do we manufacture every single one of the 91 main sector sectors classified by the standard industrial classification of the United Nations, we also export every single one of those 91 sectors. How do you get manufacturing going in South Africa? Well, if you take clothing as a good example. So a Chinese clothing exporter gets uh, probably between 10 and 20 percent subsidy from uh, the general, because they have a military dictatorship, by the way, uh, and, and then they export the, the, the T-shirts to South Africa and other countries. And because of the fact that it's a communist dictatorship, they're very, very parsimonious with, with the truth. Uh, it's very difficult to find out exactly what that, that subsidy is. By the way, this is a, an economic felony. And in terms of the World Trade Organization rules, you can actually prevent those products from entering your country. But our government has been, you know, uh, leaning over to China and, and what's happening at Trade and Energy, I just don't know. It's like the one-way street story all over again. I must maybe use them. Because if you slap a 10% quota on these imports from China, which won't make a dent, not the faintest dent in their export value, but it will enlarge your domestic market by a mammoth amount. And the beauty of a quota is you know exactly by how much your domestic market will increase in terms of volume. We can probably create, with a 10% quota on Chinese textiles and clothes, we can probably create, I'm guessing, at least 27, 28,000 jobs. I did that uh, exercise quite a number of years ago. And you can do that with a number of other items as well, including plastics, by the way. Um, so this is good news. Agriculture. Our farmers, if you take the Average uh, the combined yield per hectare of the top five field crops, divide that by the capital stock in agriculture. That's the red line, the capital stock. The blue line is the yield. Then, uh, Wandila Shishloba and myself are still looking at, at all the countries. We've, we've gone quite a distance and we haven't encountered one country that, is more, that has been more productive than our farmers in the last five years. It is unbelievable. If they want to build a monument instead of a flagpole, they should do, build a monument for this country's farmers. I think you will all agree with me. Uh, economic capital uh, is, is not a uh, you know, complicated concept. It's the, it's the assets that you need to produce goods and services. Uh, your factories, for instance, that's economic capital. For a farmer, it's a tractor. For a um, small builder, it's a bucky and a cement mixer. I think you follow my drift. For a consultant like myself, it's a laptop and a fast car. Uh, unfortunately, very fast. The Ecorolini Metropolis remind me of that very regularly. Uh, there you can see our agricultural export performance. It is absolutely fantastic. Um, and Mr. Zuma recently, uh, a couple of months ago, he said something like, this country's problem started when Jan van Riebeek got off the ship. So I asked him what year was that. <laughs> he didn't have a clue, but anyway. Um, although he has been nominated for some numismatic award for creating a new concept. It's called 11T. I'm not sure what you can divide in there, but anyway. Um, and it's classic, but the two countries that played the biggest part in establishing this country's agriculture, manufacturing and banking services, essentially our economy, uh, with a little bit of help from the French, of course, are still the, the major buyers of South African food. Those trading relations that were established hundreds of years ago are still intact today. And by the way, those two countries are also two of our most prominent sources of tourist arrivals in South Africa. The AGBIS IDC Index of Confidence in Agriculture 
last year it an all-time record high, which is great news. Um, despite all the ills, despite all the regulations that I have to battle with, a, a, there was a Lechotla the other day. Uh, what did we used to call a strategic planning session? Bosberat, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's, it's an occasion where people get together, uh, they deliberate a lot during the day and they drink a lot during the night. Almost like this event, but anyway. <laughs> uh, and at this, this Lechotla was, was all the director generals of the government departments and the theme was how to raise productivity in the public sector, which is actually a misnomer, but let's not be cynical. So they debated this terribly and then this one delegate raised his hand, he said, Mr. Chairman, why can't we get all the civil servants in Africa to work three hours a week extra, without extra pay. Hmm. The media would love this, you know. That's uh, So they, they started talking about how can we implement this, and then well, there's one concerned delegate raised his hand. He said, Mr. Chairman, is it okay if we do that in working hours? <laughs> and, and that, I must admit, is arguably one of our biggest problems right now, and that is that working hours in the private sector and working hours in the public sector are two different concepts. Not in all cases, but in too many cases, as far as I'm concerned. This will change. Uh, it can change, and it will change. When I predicted a full recovery, uh, look if my memory serves me well, I did that last year. Um, when it, it was the first conference that I spoke at, I think, in person, uh, in a year. And, and thank you very much for that. That impact will always be very close to my heart, apart from the fact that I drive past your factory every week because uh, through Brits I have to do that, that run. Um, and I predicted full recovery by the fourth quarter of 2020, not the fourth quarter of last year. Fourth quarter of last year, we hit an all-time record high. Fourth quarter of 2020, our macroeconomic our GDP in real terms was exactly what it was a year earlier. But that did not mean that all sectors had recovered. Thanks to agriculture and thanks to mining, the primary sectors, took us through this COVID, unbelievably. There were some other sectors in manufacturing that also did very well. Tourism, hospitality, bad, bad news, as you also found out in, in, your, in your businesses that, that um, service those industries, but that is recovering. So the recovery, it's a full recovery. It's a virtual full recovery, and this is terribly important in terms of my forecast of 4% growth this year, uh, is that the left behind sectors are going to come to the party. Try to get a room in Cape Town, in a guest house, this summer. I've been told it's fully booked. <laughs> uh, so I think there's going to be a hell of a lot of Airbnb activity. Uh, and they have, been, they have been listed on the, on the NASDAQ. I think it's one of my, uh, my son's firm's uh, companies that. Uh, good timing. Retail trade sales. This is obviously good news to you guys because you indirectly and sometimes directly services, service these industries. I see there's somebody, uh, oh yes, my ex-student uh, uh, is at Woolies. Where is my ex-student now? He is here somewhere. Um, he's at Woolies. I never travel without these Woolies cl uh, carb clever bars. You know, in that I love temptation before you pay. You know, that stuff there. It's just brilliant stuff. That and a big built on from Groenkloof Slagheis uh, in Pretoria. And as you can see, this traditional spike that we have in retail sales in December of every year for the last 60 years is because of most people get their bonuses in December, am I right? Plus, you've been saving pre for presents for the kids and grandchildren in my case, and it's spending time, it's holiday time, and you spend more money than you actually bargained for. But uh, it, it's not as, as defined as in the past because you have the first part of that spike in November. And that's because of Black Friday and Cyber Monday, of course. And once again, a new all-time record high. Total formal non-agricultural employment has been slow to respond. Now, if you, if you take this slide and you look at average salaries in the economy and you try to reconcile that with total retail spend, then you find that there's a gap somewhere. Somewhere in South Africa, there are people that are working and they're earning money and, and they're spending money. <laughs> But Stats SA doesn't know about them. <laughs> and I'll give you an example. Let Labila, which is not far from your Brits factory, is a place where I also visit almost once a week to um, swap the guy that works for me there part-time on my little farm. And um, that place has become a mega city. 
There are restaurants, there are internet cafes, there are hardware stores like you can't believe. You do capture some of the hardware stores, this is informal sector activity, you do capture some of the activity because they buy from the cash build in that area. But they also add a lot of their own value. They make their own bricks, they make their own uh, cement even, I wouldn't build a house with that, quite frankly. And they get uh, the, the sand and the gravel there from all kinds of places next to the road, by the way. And it's this informal sector employment that has been one of our saving graces, since that SA doesn't know too much about that, unfortunately. The AFRIMAT Construction Index, Andries van Heerden, the CEO of AFRIMAT, they've got head office here in Cape Town, I think they own about 100 quarries throughout South Africa. He's, uh, he's an engineer, one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He bought a small iron ore mine under the noses of Kumba. Uh, recently also a small manganese mine, so he's diversified that company. But this has got nothing to do with their own business. This is uh, nine in individual uh, indicators which are blended into a composite index of construction sector activity, including the value of building plans passed. The, the data came out yesterday for the first quarter. It's 9% higher than in the first quarter of last year. So the construction sector in this country is not dead and buried, as some cynical economists would like you to believe. Um, we at the Optimum Investment Group, uh, I'm their economic advisor on a part-time basis, we do our homework uh, a little bit better than that. Uh, value of retail hardware sales at current prices reached an all-time record high. Loki, I'm busy, and, and well, I'm not terribly busy uh, uh, doing this because I haven't had the time, but when, when I have a little bit of spare time, hopefully in July when everybody goes hunting or to their, their uh, beach houses, uh, Mosul Bay and Still Bay and those, those places, uh, then my business falls flat, and then I'm going to compile, and, and if I remember, I'll send you the list of the records, economic records that were established during COVID. It's unbelievable. And even now into 2022, this is one of them. Wholesale trade sales in real terms. All-time record. Running at almost three quarters of a trillion rand a quarter. This is not a Mickey Mouse economy. We have one of the 35 largest economies in the world. And thanks to companies like Impact and many other companies, Sassel, I mean, you, you name them, Astra, we can hold our own with, with any high-income country in the world, let alone emerging markets. And we have the added advantage that we, uh, we speak English. It is a huge advantage in, in terms of international trade. Uh, the EPSA BR Purchasing Managers Index, uh, PMI, has been running above the 50 level, which is the difference between expansion and contraction, for 19 of the last 20 months. The only exception being in July last year, and I think one of your first slides, Loki, was... Uh, no, that was the floods, but the havoc that was caused with the looting, um, every single one of the 250 pep stores that was looted has been reopened, refurbished, and not only have all those people got their jobs back, but they've actually expanded their jobs because they've got better security. <laughs> so uh, there, there are sometimes there are good things happening uh, f from a disaster. If I had been reduced to only three or four or five slides, this would probably have been one of them as well. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's the leading business cycle indicator, also a composite index. There you can see the Nene dismissal. Uh, we are the only country in the world that had a, a finance minister for a weekend special. Uh, it's not the same like uh, the, the, the Willie's, um, those chicken strips. Uh, five for 25 rand. Uh, uh, and then the Ramaphosa victory. So business confidence has a hell of a lot to do, ultimately, with this index. Then you had the pandemic, and look where it is now. Just on, on a side note, um, I must just verify the reason for, for that spike in the uh, fourth quarter of 2021, but the, the four-year average for foreign direct investment inflows into South Africa has also reached an all-time record high in the fourth quarter of last year. Um, since Ramaphosa took over, it just went one way. But there is still a lot of uh, work ahead. Okay, so this is the same slide in the sense it's also the leading business cycle indicator, the blue line. But we're going right back to before the, the democratic era, January 1994. What were we buying? Who can remember? In the shops. Blackies course. <laughs> we were buying bully beef and baked beans. You know, candles. Bad combination, but anyway. Um, and then we showed the world that despite, despite the underlying conflict potential, 
The cultural groups in South Africa are all a meaningful part of the whole. And if you sit around a table long enough, as we did for two and a half odd years, Kudesa, who remembers Kudesa? It was terribly boring, all those raps of Kudesa in the evenings, except when Eugene Ter uh, Terblanche and his buddies from OVB went through there in a 4 by 4 remember? Six months in the Chuki. <laughs> Des uh, they deserved that. Um, but we sat around that table long enough to produce what? To produce the world's finest constitution. The United Nations is on record for saying that there is no constitution in the world that so closely resembles the UN Charter on Human Rights than South Africa's constitution. And who was the main author of the UN Charter on Human Rights? Jan Smits. So Jan Smits is alive and well. And he's spirit and living in our constitution, which is good news. But I want you to focus on the red, on the red dashed line. That is our per capita income trend. So if you ever wondered, was democracy good for this economy? Despite the ills we have and the state of the roads and, and the load setting, the answer is yes. When it comes down to your fundamental indicator, per capita income, it was 63,000 Rand in 1994 at today's prices. And just before COVID, it went to 86,000 Rand at today's prices. And once again, as I said, we are classified as upper middle income. And what this slide actually tells you if there's any doubt over what happened in July last year, there are people that say, yes, it's socio-economic stuff, people blame too many poor people. Yes, of course we have poverty. There's poverty in every country in the world, quite, quite frankly. Even in San Francisco, if you visit the place, it's unbelievable. The fact is that nobody in this country needs to commit arson. Nobody in this country needs to steal somebody else's property. Because in your average household, there are between one and two Formal sector jobs paying 270,000 Rand a year. There are between one and two informal sector jobs paying on average 80,000 Rand a year. And there are between two and three people that get a grant every month between 350 Rand and 2,000 Rand a month. There is no reason for somebody to loot or to commit us in this country. What happened in July was politically motivated. And I don't have to tell you who, lay, who lies behind that. Jimmy Money and those people, the red group, the radical economic transformation group, not that they have a clue what that means, by the way. Uh, I once uh, encountered Irvin Jim at the ETV studios in Randburg a, a couple of years ago, and I asked Irvin whether he knows the definition of a communist. I subsequently realized he doesn't know much about most things, but anyway, so I told him, uh, Irvin, a communist is somebody who's got nothing but he wants to share it with you. <laughs> Which is better than, the, uh, well, it's not as good as an economist. An economist is somebody that will marry Charlize Tron for her money. <laughs> so people bitch about the rand from time to time. I don't think our agricultural exporters are, are too worried about the rand. Uh, remember that if your currency takes it up, it's always good for your exports. It's not so good for the oil price, but it's in rand terms. But anyway, so where is the rand today? Uh, this is now last night. Two of my previous jobs were financial editor of a daily newspaper, which you kindly mentioned. Um, and also, um, I was also a management accountant at the bakery group. And I learned two important lessons in those jobs. People do not like stale news, and they don't like stale bread. And I don't give you stale data. This is 23 May's exchange rate. And the rand, yesterday, last night, was 21% stronger than in the beginning of 2020, April 2020. It is the strongest currency in the world against the dollar since April 2020. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, it was 28% stronger. So the rand is not doing too badly. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the first quarter of this year, it, it, <laughs> it gained more than 10% against, against the euro. Now, if you had taken... If you had if you had taken a side bet on the rand, strengthening by 10% against the euro in three months' time on 1 January, I think you could have gotten odds of about a million to one, quite frankly. And it, it did happen. The rand is only about 15% uh, undervalued today. Um, I calculate the rand's real value and what it should be trading at against the dollar on a monthly basis for currencies direct. They, are, they have a head office in Cape Town. It's an international uh, forex trader. 
They literally take out all the hassle out of any foreign exchange. Whether you've inherited money overseas, you want to buy property there, whatever, I can really recommend them. These guys know what they're doing, guys and girls. Um, especially, you know, dealing with SARS and dealing with uh, the Reserve Bank and, and all that kind of stuff. The, the tourists are returning slowly but surely. The JSE recently took a knock. If you get your optimum uh, investment uh, company statement uh, at the end of the, this quarter and you see it's worth less than the previous quarter or whichever company you're invested with, please don't panic because these things happen to equities. You have sell-offs because interest rates in America are increasing and then your sort of uh, Mickey Mouse uh, nervous fund managers overseas, then they sell emerging market equities, including South Africa, and then they buy U.S. Uh, treasuries, which gives them, I think, today 3%, something like that. Now, just to put that in perspective, Kumba's dividend yield right now, as we speak, is 20%, 2 zero, 20% dividend yield, with an, an excellent chance of a capital gain in the next 18 months as the Chinese economy opens up and buys iron ore like it's going out of fashion. Now, please don't... Uh, I'm not giving you investment tips, by the way. I'm just telling you that I think it's crazy to sell South African equities and buy U.S. bonds, personally. But this presents buying opportunities, so please don't worry about that. Don't get into the equity market uh, like a gambler. If you buy some shares, just keep them there. Uh, manufacturing sales, in nominal terms, hit an all-time record high in March, but if you adjust it for inflation, it was the second highest in history. Once again, another record. This is my favorite record. In 2020, the first COVID year, we had 1.1 trillion rands worth of exports, that was the second highest ever. And then in the second COVID year, we raised that by 60% to 1.7 .7 trillion rand. This is unbelievable stuff. We have the strongest balance of payments probably in the world. And it's especially minerals and precious metals, but it's not only them. It's also uh, manufactured articles. It's also plastics. It's chemicals. It's vehicles, vehicle spares. There are a lot of industries that have added to that. And there you can see one of the main reasons. I mean, the increases in the first quarter of our commodity export prices have been unbelievable. Will the commodity boom end? Eventually, yes, but I don't think in a hurry. And the reason why I say that is that World Lab has calculated that in the next eight years, eight years, 1.5 billion people, that's more than China's population, around the world, in all countries, will enter what they call the middle class. Now, the middle class is very broadly defined depending on the region where you're in. In, in, in many African countries, it's defined as people that can spend 10 US dollars a day. In other regions, it's 100 dollars a day, and in some, it's a several hundred dollars a day, depending on your region and the cost of living, etc., etc. What's the big deal about the middle class? If you enter that status, middle class, then, for the first time in your life, you start thinking about buying a microwave or a fridge, even if it's a second-hand one, an entry-level car, maybe even a startup house. And that unleashes demand for all the stuff that we produce in South Africa, uh, primary and secondary sectors. So, remember, there have only been four super cycles for commodity prices in the last 130 years, but it has an upward phase and a downward phase. And ne neither one is linear, linear, so it goes up and down, and sometimes if you don't understand this, uh, this, this topic, subtopic of economics very well, and, and you research it very well, then you may get, if, if there's a decline, like the oil price will decline probably later this year, when the war in Ukraine ends, uh, Russia is going to have, they don't have a problem with Forex now, because they're forcing companies to buy oil and gas in rubles, which has been a very shrewd move by that warmongerer. Um, Communist, plaksam, an uh, alcohol. But th they're not importing. They're not importing. When the war ends, they are going to have to import to get their whole economy growing again. They're going to be desperate for foreign exchange, and they're going to pump oil onto the world market. It's the second largest oil producer in the world. The oil price is going to come tumbling down. I'm predicting that within six weeks after the war ends, the oil price will be $60 a barrel. This is very good news for us, by the way. So... Um, I'm going to conclude just with, uh, Loki, uh, when I spoke to you last year, I had a slide with 20 growth drivers. Um, and I was wondering whether I could match that again. Some of them are still the same, but there are some newcomers here. And I've touched on many of these. 
uh, upgrading of sovereign debt, high levels of uh, PMIs, I've showed you slides about all of this, the, the shift in economic policy, where is this tangible? In the semi-privatization of Transnet, it's tangible also in recent announcements when he forced Mantasa to increase that 10 megawatt of renewables to 100 megawatt, you remember that one? The National Treasury waiving of some of the rules of the Public Financial Management Act to allow the infrastructure to progress, uh, the new program to, to progress uh, 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 more swiftly. They're all over the show, you can start seeing Ramaphosa's hand. And after December's ANC elective conference, you're going to see sparks flying. Um, you can have a quick look at that. I've shown you most of these slides. Uh, upward phase of the, the, uh, of the super cycle for commodities. And uh, lo and behold, uh, okay, I've got another 20 here. <laughs> there were 10 on that slide, and there's 10 on this one. Uh, I'm going to end with uh, demographics. According to the European Union, the ultimate growth driver for any country, merging market, high income, is demographics. And we don't have a problem there. <laughs> People are flocking to this country. Uh, there are some that are leaving. Who of you knows somebody in Australia? <laughs> Do you know that this has had a beneficial effect on the world labor market? Because it has increased the average IQ of both countries. <laughs> but we really have a hell of a lot going for us. And by the way, you won't read this in the papers, not in many papers, but you may read it uh, in my column, which I'll, I'm, I'm Gladly put you on the mailing list. Uh, I'll speak to Cami uh, uh, about that. And then my last slide. Bloomberg, after many years and the assistance of Michael Spence and Nobel laureate, finally came to the party uh, with their Development Drivers Index. They, sell, they took 114 countries, representing 98% of the, the global GDP. And they ranked them in terms of their medium-term three to five years growth and development potential and South Africa came out 39th out of 114 countries. This is not bad going. Um, we've got uh, a hell of a lot going for us in South Africa. I just wish I was a little bit younger. Uh, there was a song many years ago, the future is so bright you've got to wear shades. I think I should dig that out again. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>